All right, guys, what's up? I'd like to start with a little post, start with some positivity. Today, what I'd really like to talk about is how a lot of people have this sort of adversarial relationship with really role-playing in combat. Now, I love role-playing in combat, and I love creative solutions to problems in combat. However, I feel that the way that a lot of RPGs go about trying to develop uh, people and characters during character creation, it's almost an adversarial relationship. Do I make myself a dedicated support character or a combat-heavy tank? If I try to skill out my character to be more true to the role-play aspects of this game, am I letting my group down? I think that's a question a lot of people have. So, what are your thoughts? Don't worry, there's a lot more in this video. I think that a lot of people are very hostile to the idea of character optimization and um, min-maxing and power gaming. Now, I definitely am subscribed to Andrew Wood's channel, and I would highly recommend you ch checking it out, as well as The Gentleman Gamer. However, I'm with a slightly different school of mind than I feel Andrew Wood is. Not that there's anything wrong with his opinion. Um, a lot of people get an enjoyment out of playing powerful characters, heroes. Now... There, I started out very powerful characters that could do ridiculous things in combat that were also optimized for roleplay. When I really get into the depth of character creation in a system, I can make very powerful builds very quickly. Um, and I've intentionally... I usually do about four to six drafts of a character before I actually play it. Simply because I realize that my first build, it's more like, no, dude, this is ridiculous. It's like, I didn't take anything for anything but combat. So I nerf it a little, I'm like, okay, I'm going to trade out this feed with another one. And, you know, then someone else takes a look at it, they're like, why did you take that? I'm like, well, it was kind of something I was wanting to do anyways. And it kind of balances the character out, where if this is combat and this is role play, it kind of comes, kind of brings them both down to about here. I make wonderful support characters. My 12 level knight could buff the bard and paint and run a city and, you know, was also a tank. Possible. I think that a lot of people go for a gimmick. You know, Don Forge talked about this, but. I kind of disagree with him. I really do, because he said that, oh, I want to be a two-handed barbarian. It's like, well, you've eliminated everything else. It's like, true, but that's a pessimistic way of looking at it, in my opinion. Instead, that character now has the ability to focus on, what are all the wonderful things I can do with a two-handed weapon? Dude, take acrobatics or jump, depending on the addition you're using. I believe 4.0, yeah, it uses acrobatics, which is... Um, jump and tumble combined and I'm getting into technical stuff and I love keeping that out of my videos but this is about character creation and game mechanics themselves so um, I feel that most systems similar to D&D most D20 based systems are very open enough to allow for roleplay optimized as well as combat optimized characters if you feel you have the talent to mathematically to make a mathematically sound character that has a strong core concept, well, why are you so good at fighting? Well, since a young age, it's been my talent, and I feel the need to protect people. is a much better justification than, I like to hit things. Now, having simple characters like that, I don't find anything wrong with it. Not at all. So long as you make them interesting in some way to the point where you can hold your own outside of combat. That being said, I'd like to talk about different groups and communities I've seen. Um, normally when I go online, I'll ask for help with the newer system because I love buying and checking out new systems. Um, the thing is, though, a lot of communities are hostile towards certain things. I mean, I think I mentioned this in my werewolf video, but I just went online to the White Wolf forums to ask about for help with this lupus I made, and he loved guns. Oh, lupus don't use guns in the war. Yes, but 
he got brought into the human world, you know, and they were sort of showing him what this new modern-day society was, trying to integrate him so that he could move between both. He was a, I believe the third type character, a lot of spells and stuff, yeah. So it made sense for him to have a ranged weapon, not to say that he didn't love using his bare hands in the nine-foot snarling death beast form, you know, the Kronos form, love that. But, you know, he basically was shown CSI Miami and Dirty Harry movies in ad nauseum. So yeah, he really likes guns. He really likes heavy revolvers. It's, well, oh, I don't, I don't want a spear. I don't care. You know, I know how to use a bow. They're pretty cool, but you know, I don't, I don't care. <laughs> Why would I want that when I can have a revolver? That's his mindset. It's like technology isn't bad. A lot of people from his tribe disagree with that, but he's him. Now, different groups of people. I've um, I've run this one module I made. It was um, 3.5, completely custom made by me. Um, I took a lot of motivation from different settings, and basically each setting is its own country. So we've got Sandstorm to the west, which is the Bloodlands. I'm trying to keep my hand on camera. This is weird. It's like doing something in a mirror. <laughs> um, Crimea is Greyhawk Dragonlance-ish. I've never actually used those settings, but I've heard people talk about them. I'm like, yeah, I can do that pretty well. Ravenloft is essentially this country called Nighthaven, and they have all the lycanthropes and vampires. Fun. Lawful Evil Society actually gets along great with their neighbors. They're really polite, focused on etiquette. Um, misdemeanors are treated as you know, just that. Public drunkenness, uh, they just make sure you get home. They might drag you home, but you're going to get home safe. Um, anything more serious than that, uh, <laughs> they like the death penalty. Um, they also like putting people on ghoul patrol. Due to their draconian laws, they have an abundance of dead bodies, and also necromancy is legal, so naturally there's a lot of ghouls. Uh, say there's a family dispute over land. You have got, you know, one person says we own this, or some sort of blood feud, and, you know, words turn into action, push comes to shove, and one man is left standing and the other is dead. This isn't, to them, the same as someone going to someone's house and murdering them in the dead of night for some sort of other reason. This was a crime of passion. In medieval societies, a lot of that kind of gets the slip, but with this society, it's more like you have to serve five years on the ghoul patrol, and you end up guarding the body of the man you killed. Very powerful sentiment, and basically you're honoring the other's family in that way. It seems fair, and ultimately both families usually accept it. There are exceptions, but the people of that town know that their laws are draconian. They know that they are rigorously enforced, but there's virtually no crime. The cities are clean. Um, the guards are polite and genuinely helpful. The guard who's as likely to stab a thief in the streets or beat him to death with his spiked gauntlets will gladly get off of his high horse and help an old lady across the street. Lawful evil. They are ruthless, but they do still, they are still human and do have morals. Um, Elfenheim, I didn't flesh out too much. Nice straight roads through the forest, all that curvy stuff. Um, half elves are sterile. Uh, you actually have to go through Nighthaven to get from Elfenheim to Crimea. Crimea is like the human center. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that makes trade interesting. But different groups' reactions to that particular setting were very interesting to me, because some of them, like, the border between Crimea and Nighthaven is very obvious. It's like nice windswept prairies and plains, you know what I mean? The typical justice, knightly-oriented society. Not many forests. There are some forests to the east near the mountains, but not many. Um, so, as they left the fort, uh, I initially have them railroaded around a bit, sort of a sightseeing tour of Crimea, and then they really get let out into a sandbox. But, um, 
what they basically do is as they're personally deported and patrolling, from the other side they see a group of people staring at them. It's a patrol, it's a border patrol from Nighthaven. Some groups just completely ignored it and just were like, ah, beeline it, we don't want to fuck with those guys. Because they knew Nighthaven had lycanthrops and stuff. Another group, like, they started arguing with each other and the other guys saw it and they're like, what's going on? Thinking, like, there was going to be some border dispute, they didn't know what was going on. So the Nighthaven people approached, and I saw this spry little werewolf there. He was sort of more comic relief amusement, very lithe, very dexterous, like to do like, like to crouch real low and sort of do like backwards handsprings, like low to the ground, like to do like somersaults and rolls and stuff. Sort of the stereotypical like cute wolf boy thing you see in a lot of animes, and a lot of these guys were anime fans, so I thought they'd get a kick out of it. They did. It was amusing. And another time, basically, they sort of, like, called him over, and then, like, they started talking for a bit. And they're like, oh, we're on a patrol to take care of some bugbears, because that was their mission. And the um, guys from Nighthaven were all like, yo, uh, is that sort of like our ghoul patrol? Since Necromancy was made legal, we um, we had a ghoul problem. And they're like, okay. That group, like, okay, going this way now. We've got to go. And they're like, oh, really? You sure you don't need any help with anything? They're like, no, 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 no. We're, we're leaving. We're leaving. It, it was pretty amusing. So just those three different reactions from the exact same scenario. It's very intriguing to me. Um, I love to encourage roleplay, but, you know, people like combat. They build characters for it. They, they do all this time tearing through books to get all the feats they want. Just, just let them have fun. <laughs> I don't mind that. I mean, I'm a strategy game fan. Uh, not so much a grand strategy like Total War, although I have played those games and really enjoyed them. I've played Rome, I've played, my, played Medieval 2. Believe it or not, given my taste in fantasy, was not the biggest fan of Medieval 2. I really liked Rome, Total War, and Shogun more. But, um, I love Fire Emblem, I love Tactics games, Final Fantasy Tactics, Advance, and Advance 2. I liked Advanced 1 more. But, you know, just. That's what I like to do. So, as a game master, it was kind of hard for me adjusting at first, getting used to not being the winning side. You know what I mean? Like, crap, I'm losing people. <laughs> it was just a weird mental shift. It's like I'm used to just dominating a battlefield. So, um, almost cognitive dissonance. So what we've covered so far is optimization for roleplay versus combat, how different groups react to things, and I'd really like to encourage a conversation in the um, comments below. But no one comments on my videos. Um, so yeah, this is a nice quick video I did, just covering a few topics, giving people something to think about. Um, really just wanting to start conversations within the YouTube community. Um, I'm not that big on here. Um, unfortunately, I haven't been able to post much. I tend to have... Well, my house has been virtually destroyed. We're doing renovation. And three rooms of um, the ceiling and walls are missing. So, yeah. <laughs> been a little busy. Peace out. Catch you later.